So this is the second session, I suppose, of of the, the two-parter that I'm doing with you that we kicked off on Sunday. On Sunday, we thought about the need to prepare disciples for storms. Um, we reflected in helping people realize following Jesus doesn't make us immune from trouble, but Christianity comes with a cost and, and discipleship is fraught with difficulty. But in this session this afternoon, I want to consider how we can walk with a company and effectively disciple people when they're in the midst of difficulties in their lives. Uh, there's obviously a pastoral care angle to these situations that we'll think about today, but I also want to consider today how we can how we can also see times of testing and trial as opportunities for spiritual growth and use them or turn them into discipling moments as well. So this is what we would call here rubber hitting the road discipling. So it's, you know, this is the practical outworking and it's, you know, it's important for all seasons, but particularly recently, I think perhaps those that we disciple might have stared grief in the face or walked with uncertainty or had the anxiety of a virus or lost and had their lives disrupted in new ways. In our culture, people experiencing unemployment, succumbing to stress, whatever it's been, there's been a variety of, of ways. And whenever Jay and I were planning these sessions, one of the things that we were reflecting on was actually the need to help people um, to develop this kind of overarching uh, theology, I suppose, of suffering but also of how to, how to disciple in the midst of it. Uh, I had a big, long session planned out, and then uh, I, I reworked it actually last night after being with you guys for a couple of days, and I thought, you know, I don't know if what you need is lots more input. And so we're going to have a bit of fun in, a, in about 10 minutes or so, and we're going to look at a couple of, uh, I was going to say real-life scenarios, um, but a couple of case studies, let's say. They're not totally real life, but they're not too far away from, <laughs> from real situations. And uh, I'll, I'll throw those up at the time. And um, just to help set the tone for a time together, I'm, um, one, of the, one of the images in the Bible I've found most helpful over the last year is the biblical theme and image of the wilderness. So the wilderness is actually mentioned 255 times in the Old Testament. I, I read that somewhere. I haven't counted myself, so I, I, I'm trusting that's true. Uh, but whenever the wilderness is mentioned, it's mostly a hard and a difficult place for all of God's people who are found there. And it's, all, it's often symbolized or used as a symbol as a place of difficulty and testing. But the wilderness is also presented in the Bible as a place where God gives people a new way forward. So the most obvious example is Israel wandering around for 40 years. But in parallel to that wandering failing, testing, they experienced God's provision in remarkable ways, and it moved them into something new, literally a physical place. So it was a place of testing, but it was also a place of education. I think the wilderness uh, can be used by God uh, for, so the wilderness is often a place in the, in the Bible of encounter with God, often a place of formation to become someone new, and a place of preparation to move God's people into a new reality. In terms of encounter, we often see people meet God in the wilderness. So Abraham was called by God. Where was he called by God? In a wilderness. Moses meets God in the wilderness or in the desert of a burning bush. Hagar was dumped there, felt abandoned with an unwanted child, meets God. The people of Israel have mentioned, wandered for 40 years, but it was their place of learning about their God. Elijah Here's the whisper of God when feeling in despair. John the Baptist chose to live there. I don't know why. And John the Baptist chose to live there. And then Jesus went there right before his public ministry. And I think there's that reality with seasons of difficulty in a disciple's life that it might seem like God has forgotten or abandoned them. But it might just be a place where they encounter him afresh. And. Um, I read a book last year called Reappearing Church by uh, uh, someone called Mark Sayers. And he says this in the book. He says, before the rains of renewal come, the soil must be broken up and turned over so it can be ready to receive. And sometimes in those that we disciple, at times, 
and perhaps not right in the moment of crisis, okay, but some of the things that we, some of the ways that we, as we disciple them, is actually helping them to recognize when is God, or how is God turning over the soil of your life so that you might be ready to receive something fresh or new from him? Helping people to recognize that. That's what it means, I think, to walk with people through difficulty at times. Um, to help them recognize how God is, is leading and shaping. In terms of the formation word, God also uses the wilderness to shape his people into someone new. So Abraham was becoming a father to the nations. God was giving Moses a new vision of who he was, confidence in the task he was calling him to. Israelites learning to become the people of God. They were being formed by the laws of God as well, receiving those for the first time. Jesus underwent testing and temptation from Satan as well. There's a formation that goes on in the, in the valley or in the wilderness and renewed faith, new vision, fresh direction. And again, sometimes it's helping people to recognize that, that these tests or trials that might be coming along in their life is actually part of their formation. James chapter one talks about that, doesn't it? And in terms of uh, those amazing verses, which... Uh, I, I just find it incredible where G James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because Why would we consider it joy? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So James is saying there's something about this testing, this, these experiences that actually will, can form you, shape you through perseverance. And then just that lastly, the word preparation, the wilderness is always an in-between place. So it's not the eternal or the final destination for, for any of those people. So Abraham being sent to a new land, Moses being sent to address Pharaoh, the Israelites being prepared for the promised land, Jesus on the verge of beginning his public ministry. And in all of these situations, God used the wilderness to move his people into something new. In other words, that even though the wilderness is hard now, an important thing to note is that it does not last forever. And there's something about suffering that we need to remind people of that too. This may be your story now, and even in this season of your life, but it is not an eternal story for those who trust in Jesus. For those who are in Christ, difficulty will not last forever. Pain is not an eternal reality. And so there is hope as we disciple people not to say that it's okay it's all it'll all blow over tomorrow <laughs> but to say actually pain is not uh, it's not your final destination it is not your final reality when you're in christ and um i was at our church on sunday morning um i wasn't preaching it's was great so that's why i can say that there was such a good sermon and uh we were reflecting in Daniel chapter six and uh, our preacher drew out um, how that actually, who was, the, who was the troubled person in Daniel chapter six? Was it Daniel as he was spending a night in the pit of the lion's den? Or was it King Darius who was in a palace? Where would you choose to spend the night, by the way, the pit or the palace? And yet, there was peace. There was, sorry, there was restlessness in the palace. And there was peace in the pit. Um, sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, um, even as we walk through difficulty and those that we disciple walk through difficulty, the wilderness, we experience wilderness. It can still become, be a time of knowing the peace and the presence of God. So for those that we disciple, how do we help them to recognize the moving of God in their life so that they can open their lives to experience in him. And we know today that none of this is clean cut. None of this is simple. It's not like saying some of, you know, those answers to people who are right in the midst of crisis. We're not trying to learn a few trite answers that we can say to people to get us out of awkward conversations or to help people make, you know, feel better just for a moment. But on the other hand, there can be a framework that we can develop here to help people to understand and walk through their difficulty. Okay, let, let's just move into our last bit of teaching. And what I wanted to do, I, so this is where I said I completely rewrote the session because 
I had this sort of front loaded at the start and I was going to give you, you know, nine thoughts and techniques about discipling people through difficulty or practical things. And then I thought, let's hear from you first. And now what you'll begin to hear and see are some of the threads that you've mentioned. And all I'm trying to do is put words on them uh, or phrases that you can either remember or, you know, kind of put, turn them into concepts or reality. So here we go. Um, nine ways, I think, or practical ways. And again, as I said earlier, this is rubber hits the road stuff. Um, so, yeah, um, nine ways I think we can try to disciple people, care for them as well um, in times of crisis. So the first one, John, really unpacked really helpfully for us, the, appropriate, the appropriateness of lament. And I think rather than rushing too quickly sometimes to explaining why a crisis has happened or pointing out even the silver linings, it's helpful to learn the language of lament. So and I think there has been an element of us learning this over the past year as we've maybe lamented, you know, the pain of things that we've lost and not being able to gather for worship or, or, or other things. Um, I should say as well, just picking up our previous thread, lamenting is not the same as having a rant on social media or just complaining about all our problems. It's, it's primarily an expression of sorrow that's directed to God or at least in the presence of you know, um, kind of, I guess, a community that might direct us there. So, um, and and I, yes, followers of Jesus live with hope, but we also maintain real, realism and a realistic reality that shouldn't try to bypass or minimize pain. And the Psalms show us this. The Psalms are full of it. Lament, lament is appropriate for the people of God. And I think our posture is vital as we disciple others in difficulty, because that doesn't mean that we always try to sh share our own opinions or our thoughts or even answer people's questions always, but we give space for people to articulate the pain that they're, ex they're experiencing. Um, so it's appropriate to allow people to dwell on their pain. Um, I read a really helpful article about this uh, a couple of months ago, and just this is a quote from it. Um, this guy, Mark Vrogoop, I think, um, wrote a book called Weep With Me, and he says this, and laments help us through suffering by directing our hearts to make the choice often daily to trust in God's purposes behind the pain. In this way, a lament is one of the most theologically informed practices of the Christian life. So essentially, lament has given people the opportunity to acknowledge their suffering. A practical example of this could be, let's say, in a small group setting, reading a psalm of lament or in a worship setting, you know, reading a psalm of lament and, and in a small group setting, giving people space to share something that they're sad about. And then turning that somehow into a prayer to offer those things to God, you know. So God, we have articulated in this last few minutes our pain. We want to bring these before, before you. And then maybe wrapping that time up with some Bible verses that talk about trust or hope or, or maybe even the end of some of the psalms that you were reading out as well because they often do that for us but um yeah um secondly the, the importance of presence again i think carly maybe mentioned this but um how can we simply be with people and and be present and even in their pain and again i think that's been one of the hardest things of the last year and in, in our context we've certainly learned it's, it's hard not to be physically present or rush to people in their own struggles and our own church family experienced this we we our pastor's wife um, died uh, suddenly uh, about this time last year and in the midst of this most severe lockdown in our country. And it was the strangest sadness. It was the inability to visit and gather or even hug or shake hands and, and phone calls and cards and messages. They're felt probably inadequate, but there were still ways to show concern and offer care. So sometimes we need to be creative about this, you know, but picking up from Marcus's theme earlier, if discipleship involves proximity and presence, then that shouldn't be any different in times of difficulty. So again, just worth considering, how can you be present with someone experiencing difficulty, whether a walk or a coffee or even an activity? Because at times people may not always want to chat, but simply have someone with them just doing something. So, um, and again, someone taught me this in ministry, but sometimes just showing up is enough. We don't always need our words, just show up. Um, 
Uh, thirdly, the helpfulness of normality. So this is kind of linked, but um, normal routines can actually be really helpful in the midst of dark darkness and doubt. So that first scenario of the couple turning up to small group, sometimes that's what you want to hold out to people. Hey, we'd love to have you back involved in the routines. I think Gordy touched on that. Um, the, the most helpful thing we can do sometimes is to maintain regular rhythms, to offer them companionship or hope or even distraction. Um, uh, a few months ago at the end of yet another online small group meeting that we had, someone who had been entirely muted throughout the whole conversation spoke for the first time and he said, I really didn't want to come online tonight because of what's going on for us right now. But And this is the phrase that I, he used. He said, but I just decided I had to see your faces and what you shared tonight is exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you. I just needed to see your faces. And for some people, picking up what Butch said earlier on, people do, you know, deal with things differently. But some people, it's just a, a normal routine, you know. Um, so, yeah, a couple of years ago, you know, a young leader I was investing in texted me to say that his dad had just walked out in his family. And it was early afternoon and I'd work commitments that, that day and a speaking commitment that night. I couldn't drop it. But I just said, you know, do you want to just come with me to speak at this event? Like it was training leaders. He wasn't really interested in it, to be honest. But he came with me in the car and we just had food on the way. And and he helped me set up the chairs. <laughs> and, you know, that for him, that was, I think it was important to bring him out of his immediate environment. Um, don't underestimate the power of inviting people into an ordinary situation. Um, the need for hope, obviously, and something that's important in moments of crisis is not just to be focused on physical blessings, but to remind people of their spiritual ones. So in our teaching and discipleship, how can we emphasize some of the key biblical promises or spiritual blessings that are fixed and certain and eternal? You know, if we only focus on people's physical or earthly situations, then sometimes there isn't much to have hope in. There's, you know, for some people's circumstances, there's, there's there's no hope actually, but what we can do is remind people of what they have in Christ, um, the things that are fixed and certain. So not being consumed just in the circumstances, but finding hope in something greater. And again, the context of the last year, I think it's been helpful to be reminded of our spiritual blessings as well. Um, and then this is a slightly different one, and it probably needs wisdom. You know, many of these really just need wisdom, but Presence and normality is necessary, but also should be balanced with withdrawal, even absence at times. You know, I think sometimes we can be rushed to be with others in their pain so much that the distraction of others doesn't enable people to grieve or ponder or pray. And extroverts and introverts probably differ here, but it's worth stopping to ask if a rushed response in time of grief is actually fueled by our own desire to feel needed or the genuine need of the hurting person or people. Every situation is unique. So, and I do think it's okay to leave people alone sometimes, uh, particularly if we trust that Christ really is enough. Um, so of course that needs discernment, but if we know if we know the people we're discipling, then that will help to guide us. Um, I could talk all day about this next one, but I'm not. But just to flag up the weakness, the health of weakness, um, I used to assume, you know, that we dis we disciple people best through our example when we displayed our strengths and abilities. Um, but the more, you know, the more I showed my amazing humility <laughs> or displayed my deep devotion, then, then actually that would transfer into the lives of those I was leading. And partly, there's, there's, that's a partial truth, okay? But I've come to realize that we disciple people also by showing our weaknesses as well. And we invited this young couple. Oh, great. We, um, we invited this young couple to take us, uh, come out for a family walk with us a couple of weeks ago. And I've been kind of investing in this guy's life. And uh, we just had a, one of those disaster afternoons with our two kids, you know. So um, I, I actually tripped one of them over <laughs> and he hurt himself. And he was, you know, he was in floods of tears, you know, crying and he was annoyed at me. I went to comfort him, you know, and he's, he, he didn't really want to be comforted by me because I he said I I was to blame, you know, and, and I was, it was an accident, but I was. And, you know, I've, we've got these this young couple just staring at us, you know, but they're watching 
they're watching. And actually, I think sometimes we learn from people from others for how they handle situations. And not just by showing how strong we are. And I've come to realize that we disciple people not just by showing our strengths, but through admitting our weaknesses. And so whenever we walk through difficulty, what do we model? What do we model? Oh, it's okay. Everything's okay. God's got me. Or actually, this is painful and this is what I'm walking through. And actually, this feels like a thorn in my flesh. And as Paul said, my grace is sufficient for you. Or he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I delight in weakness for when I'm weak, I'm strong. So we don't need more self-sufficient Christians. Weakness is healthy. And the more we acknowledge it or encourage it in others, then I think the more we will teach people to lean on Christ. Um, just two or three more to finish. And the creativity of care. Again, I, I think we've had to learn new ways to show love and concern for others. Things like old-fashioned things like picking up the phone and actually ringing people or recapturing the art of letter writing. Or, you know, for us, we've been thinking about how we could go and drop off a package of food on someone's doorstep, um, gifts delivered directly to homes, posting a handwritten card. We got a handwritten card last year from someone in, in our church. I meant the world is, you know, but I think we need to learn maybe fresh creativity in our pastoral care. In the world of social media where everyone just comments and says, oh, you know, praying, actually what does real practical care look like um, as well? So meals, rotas, leaving food, so the extra energy isn't needed to sort dinner or practical help gathering around people um, as well. The uniqueness of prayer, this probably shouldn't be number eight actually on reflection, but uh, you know, lots of the things so far, are things that we can do, practical help being present, but perhaps the most powerful thing we can do is place, in fact, not perhaps, the most powerful thing we can do is place a difficult situation into God's hands. And again, rather than offering advice, maybe our greatest ministry is simply praying for and praying with people in their pain. Um, I think the very nature of prayer is acknowledging our powerlessness. I can't do this. So I'm asking you to, God. Um, so yeah, again, praying with people is, is important too because people in pain may not have the words themselves. And so you are giving, you are literally putting words onto the situation and, and creating an environment for prayer. And, and even if you're not sure what to pray, maybe there's a portion of scripture that could do that for you as well. Um, um, and lastly, the doorway to teaching. I mentioned James chapter one earlier, you know, but suffering can be a great teacher. And I do wonder, and I think this is, I think Colleen, Colleen mentioned this earlier on, you know, but actually giving people the space and even the opportunity to reflect on that. Again, it might not be in the real real crucible moment, but it might be in uh, times of reflection later. You know, I think we need to give people space to articulate and to learn and to share what they reflect on what they've been learning. Um, I think it is appropriate, or there might be an appropriate time to gently ask people, what, what have you been learning through this? Or, you know, what has this loss taught you in your faith? Or how have you been aware of God's presence with you? You know, just phrasing some of those questions. Um, do we have the boldness to invite people to share about their pain in our churches? Would it model to others that suffering is actually an opportunity to be used by God? You're not invalid because you've been going through pain or doubt or difficulty. Um, so yeah, um, how, how can we help people to see the doorway to teaching that they that they might have. Um, just as I finish, um, I suppose in discipling people through difficulty, we'll learn that we can be helpful yet inadequate. It's that balance. We aren't enough for them, but we can still be helpful, that we should be both present and absent at times, that we can make a difference even in our powerlessness, and those who suffer can be our greatest teachers. So. Um, so yeah, um, considering how we can continue to accompany disciples in their troubles.